Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, Salutum and a very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. During your lunch time, I know your time is precious and you are probably hungry at the moment. <laughs> it's okay. And also, uh, sorry for the a little bit of delay. Fortunately, that of course, once we depend on technology and everything, there's certain things that we can that can avoid. So I thank you again for everyone for joining us, and we have a we hope to have a lovely session, a very casual one where we want to hear from one of our distinguished speakers, who's one of the what you call it, uh, captain in the industry itself. So we talk about investment. I believe most of us are in. Uh, jo joining us today, want to know more about investment, so we bring you one of the expert from the field, so we can learn more from his sharings, we can learn more from his thoughts, and also we can take something out of it. Okay, so without further ado, I would like to invite Mr. Suresh on board. How are you, Mr. Suresh? Hello, doing fine. Thank you for having us and Red West here with one of your sessions. And uh, looking forward to your questions and also answering the audience questions. Thank you so much for this afternoon. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Suresh. So, Mr. Suresh, as I understand, he's one of the uh, fund managers for Red Best. So, maybe you can introduce a little bit of yourself. Uh, well, I'm the Chief Investment Officer at Red West. Uh, we are a boutique fund management company and also financial planner. So, we serve all areas of investor from high uh, net worth to down to retail. Our core um, expertise is actually for the retail side, providing wealth management services, financial planning, and on the investment side is having a different approach to investments rather than a value-based approach or traditional approach. We try to observe market movements and then find opportunities where you can invest in. Market movements, well, you can benefit both in the short term and also in the long term. So today, when I answer your questions, I will likely not talk about valuations or anything like that. I will just talk to, talk to you about market movements, how the markets have moved and what it means to us. Because I found throughout many years, usually different factors influence the market at different times. And the best way to know what is really influencing the market is by actually observing the movements and core movements between currencies. So yeah, you know, uh, we look forward to, to serving anybody that's here and also a greater public and also thank you Smart Money again uh, for, for helping this. Okay, thank you very much Suresh for the lovely introduction and as we know that we, investment is something that most of us, I mean all of us have to take note and we also need to equip ourselves with the knowledge, the right, uh, what market information, we need to know what's going on with the market and, and where we are headed. So basically maybe I can start with my first question which is on the market itself. Okay, so as we understand now, we saw that even the Busa stock market, even our our, what you call it as NASDAQ, as our Wall Street, and also the cryptocurrency market is, I, I think is now in the bearish territory, correct me if I'm wrong, and maybe you can elaborate on why is this happening, because I thought that 2022 is the, what you call it, uh, the, the, the year that we have finally overcome COVID, we have finally, what you call it, uh, managed to weather the storm, and what, why do you think, what's happening now in the market since, since everything is going down now? Okay, uh, let me just um, talk to you about the different asset classes that we've seen. Uh, I think there's a lot of interest on cryptocurrencies, right? So uh, let me just talk about that particular area first uh, and to show you what has exactly happened. This is generally just showing you our approach to investments, um, the scenario and everything. So in that same way, we are going to use the same kind of a technique. So here is generally the Bitcoin and how it has moved as opposed to the Fed funds rate. So the most obvious reasons that people would say why the, the, these, these cryptos have been falling is because the cost of funding is getting higher or basically uh, the rates are going up. Uh, and this has, has one of the causes of the currencies to decline. But also if you look at it in another way, the US 10-year yield. So when the yields in US were very low, uh, we had a chase for investments or a chase for return. 
So that has resulted in a sharp drive in cryptocurrency. So like, for example, we had about 9.3 billion worth of flows into cryptocurrencies in the 2020. Prior to that, it was around 6.8 billion actually. So there's a lot of money going in, chasing after return rather than anything else. So that is why when the US yields started moving higher, uh, we, we see there's a reallocation of, uh, of assets and also a move towards uh, taking profit because when yields start moving higher, it's basically indicating that financial conditions are getting tighter. Money is getting a lot more expensive. Mind you, the big investors around the world, they borrow money and invest. So they'll have to have at least to cover the returns of the cost of investment. And that is one of the things that usually causes them to sell their assets and re reassess what's happening. So when it comes to the crypto world, uh, it's, it's not like one person is losing, one person is gaining in that sense. Imagine somebody buys it at 56,000 and then somebody just sells, sells just one lot at 32,000. The new price is 32,000 even though there's just one lot. So all you need is just one person to hit that lower bid and then the market will readjust. And that is generally what happens when somebody just wants to exit, they will just hit the bid and then, and then they will get out. So this has caused a big movement here. So I put Ethereum here and also crypto and the Bitcoin. And also if you look at all the other, uh, other uh, what do you call that, cryptos also, they exhibit the same pattern. So there's really very little differentiation between the currencies and therefore all of them are suffering at the same time. So, but if you move further on, if you talk about stock markets, right, earlier, you know, I think one of the questions was that cryptos were supposed to be a hedge against stock market. But here you can see, is it, they are basically positively correlated. So when money was cheap, you know, things were getting better, people just started moving to stock markets. And then they also saw, oh, you, you see, there's a gap here, right? After the stock market gain, then only the crypto started gaining. So it could be during this time, people were locked down and they didn't know what to do and people started trading and started pushing it higher. It doesn't mean that you need to have a $100,000 trade here. You just need a $1,000 trade and the currency will actually adjust higher. You know, if anybody's involved in the crypto world, you have this thing called Laudel, right? You push the price higher and everything. And when you have a market that's talking about this, is basically very speculative in nature. But this chart is just basically to show you there's a somewhat positive correlation between stock market and, and cryptos as a whole. And stock markets are also falling. So if you, if you go back and, and um, adjust it for earlier, where the Fed funds rate are starting to go up, where worries about growth is coming up, generally, because we had been having cheap money, people been buying. So when you start tightening monetary conditions, is an indication that the party is about to end. But that doesn't mean growth is going to fall, yeah? It's just the party of cheap money is ending. So when the stock market adjusts lower, and say, for example, Bank Negara tightens monetary policy, if you look at Bank Negara's statement, it's actually a very positive statement. That means growth is actually being positive. And the um, act to actually raise uh, monetary policy it's actually an acknowledgement that things are actually turning better rather than things are getting worse. So these speculative uh, assets, uh, they fall when monetary policy tighten because of a more expensive money, but that doesn't mean growth is going up. So if you can see here, the stock market has gained so much, they're just adjusting lower. And, and uh, even if it does fall up to 2,400, uh, you can actually get in over there. So buying the dips would be a good idea uh, for the longer term investments. So generally, this is what we are really saying. But one final thing also, a lot of people will show you this kind of charts where it shows the Bitcoin is in like a bubble-like territory. Uh, so it has some way to go some more lower. <laughs> so, so be very careful about this. So in that sense, if it does move higher, you want to get out of this particular asset. But in order to benefit from this particular, um, uh, I would just leave with one thing, you know, it might be not answering your question because a lot of people who are invested in the Bitcoin or, or in the cryptos have a lot of faith in the, in, in the technology. So you would want to be invested in companies that are invested, uh, involved in the blockchain more than anything else. So just to answer your question, the reason why we've seen you know, assets falling down is because the money has become more expensive to borrow. 
Right? That doesn't mean growth is going to go higher. It just means assets are pricing them lower again because they have been too excessive. And therefore, the significant dips that you see in the equity market is a good opportunity to actually buy. And since yields have moved higher also, for those who are looking for safety, they'd want to move into the yields or bond, bond assets. So it's not bad news all the way. It's just market adjusting to the new reality. Thank you. Yeah, I understand, Suresh, because uh, as you mentioned, uh, good times won't last forever. So of yes. course, there will be a few, one or two years of what you call that uh, downturn, or maybe we call it as a market crash. As long as the market normalizes itself and it, find, it finds itself at the bottom, then it will definitely go up. But but how long the bottom will last or how long the market recover, I think that's subject to our, our, our observation, our experience. So moving on to the next question. Just now you mentioned about the positive calculation piece, so we got that. So now we, we need to know since we see the stock market is down, since the crypto market is down, since all our ETFs, la, you need to you name it, uh, all in the red. So where should we invest in these, in these times, in these times of uncertainty? Okay, uh, that really depends on your objectives of your investments, right? So let's talk about those who are interested in the long term. Uh, this is one of our core products to, to advise people where to put their money over the longer term. And one of the best places to, to put it is, of course, uh, if you look at, at uh, slide number eight, the US market. You know, the US market since 2000, you see since 2000, yeah, it goes up and down and then it's been on a tear. So this particular 2009 stock markets have been pushing sharply higher. It's also because money has been very cheap. So that has been pushing markets significantly higher. But over the long, long term, this is the market that you would want to be invested in. Uh, even if you see the ringgit against the dollar itself, the dollar has been better. Now I think it's a little bit too strong. You can look for a different opportunity and also stock markets may be a little bit too high. Uh, wait for it to adjust lower but for the long-term investments those who want to put away money for the next five ten years and to earn steady returns over the year you can see here itself you you would be up around 280 percent if you even had invested in 2011 prior to that is basically a cycle because in 2001 was the dot-com bubble again a dip happened so you buy and then when 2008 came, there's another dip. Uh, you Well, ideally, you would want to sell at the top, but nobody really knows that, right? But uh, it just basically shows you if you are invested, sometimes it's good to take profit and get out rather than trying to ride the whole way through. But again, at the end of the day, you can see here, every dip is a good buying opportunity rather than you know for you to be too worried about it. Uh, as for other investments that we would be interested in uh, is that uh, it would be China. You know, a lot of people have been, uh, have been burnt by China. I, I speak to a lot of investors. And what we found is that towards the end of 2021, we had a lot of people recommending China. So a lot of people bought it around here. They wrote it up, made a lot of money, but at the end, they lost it all, of course. But that basically shows you that there has already been a run-up. So this was excessive return more than anything else. And the reason why China has been moving lower, it's because of the problems with their property sector and of course, because of the zero COVID policy. But China looks to be a good buy because it's right now back to where its long-term average is. And any dip lower to 1,200 over here is also a good buying opportunity more than anything else. So as of now, another reason also China will be good is because, well, they are of course going to reopen the central bank there is going to provide more easing and also the government itself is going to provide more funding or basically more spending in order to support the economy. Um, and also, well, they have the biggest problem with them would be uh, geopolitical tensions, but they still remain, uh, you know, global house of, of manufacturing. And the reason here is not that I love China a lot, but I just have to tell you there's a good opportunity because prices have adjusted sharply lower. So you'd want to buy here and then make quick money up to around this level and then move up. So this would be a good tactical kind of play. First, you had the long-term play. Now this would be a tactical play. Uh, for those who are still worried about China, got burnt and everything, 
you might want to look to Australia and Indonesia. This one, I may not find a lot of gains. You might actually get another five, about maybe 6% gains or more because most of the gains have already been priced in. And uh, as the central banks tighten monetary policy, we're not expecting growth to be hit too massively. It's usually, it's uh, driven by headlines more than anything else. My only worry is that yields seem to not move higher because if yields are reluctant to move higher, bond yields, that basically means they are concerned. So if you see US yields continuing moving higher, this is a good sign for the economy and therefore this is the currency you want to buy. So, and also we have, you know, yes, growth is slowing down, but it doesn't mean it's going to fall off the edge. Uh, this commodity prices are still high. There's a reopening. Reopening will continue. Just imagine we shut down on our own volition. It's not because of structural problem. Savings are very high in the US. Savings are also high in the rest of the world. Uh, there's trillions of dollars of injections. And in Malaysia, you have, you know, oil prices are very high. So Malaysia also will benefit from this. So uh, if you look at Indonesia itself, it's a huge population. It is not as exposed to external factors. And that is why we like Indonesia because domestically it can grow using its domestic factors. And if you want to play on an international movement where global growth is steady and slowly moving up rather than you know, shooting up higher, then Australia will be a good player. But this, I think most of the gains have already been done. But uh, this could be a nice uh, place to, if you want to be safe a little bit, not to be speculative and to have steady gains. Uh, the other one you want to look at is India. Uh, this would be another long-term play, but I think it's already shot up too much. Uh, with the monetary policy tightening, I fully expect India to move back down here. And this is where you want to get back in. Again, India is another long-term play. You must be very careful around this. You can buy the entire index or you can buy certain uh, companies that are maybe involved in the IT sector or in the... Uh, or in the blockchain kind of a sector. But overall, I'd rather be interested in the overall index. And this is not a recommendation right now, but this is a recommendation if it would move lower and then you get up. Uh, this chart below here, this line below here is the topics, the Japanese one. So I'm just saying, you know, if you in, enter into a emerging market, this would be a good one to invest rather than a more advanced market. Japan would be the, the least one you want to do unless you caught it in 2014. So this, I gave you three choices. Uh, one is, of course, long-term. Another one, uh, two of them are tactical. One is safe tactical. Another one is a little bit more speculative tactical. Another one is an emerging opportunity. If you watch it, you keep your cash. If you're really scared to do anything, you would, might get opportunities over on this side. So that's basically what the investment look about. And now we are going closer to home, if you, if you give me a little bit of time, yeah? So in, in Malaysia, the ringgit basically follows the dollar. I can explain to this more if anybody is interested in it, but this is just the chart to show you that the ringgit is in the orange line, the yellowish line here, and this is the dollar. Yeah. And then if you look back, the, there's different factors affecting the dollar and its movement. And this highlighted one, these dark lines that you see here, are domestic related factors that cause the ringgit to move. So from here, you can see already for very obvious reasons, the value of the ringgit is actually determined by the value of the dollar rather than what's happening domestically. Because throughout this 2018, except for 2020, Malaysia growth has actually been very steady, not really much of a concern, but the currencies have been moving up and down. Uh, so in that sense, a lot of things is actually depending on what's happening on the dollar side. And our expectation is the dollar has already moved up quite a lot to 104, and it will be pulling down because the other central banks are actually going to move ahead. We already know what the Fed is going to do. This requires a lot more explanation, but I'm just simplifying it very quickly just to tell you that we're expecting the dollar to move down. And so if the dollar is moving down, following this example, the ringgit is going to gain. So what does that mean for us? If you look here, the KLCI is positively correlated with the ringgit. So when the ringgit is weaker, the KLCI also weakens. So you can see KLCI was very strong right before the election, right? Uh, you know, and also the previous election, remember? You know, <laughs> we all forgotten that already. And then the ringgit weakened all the way down here. You see, there's also gain in the ringgit over here. 
But generally, it's not because domestic you know, policies are not that great or anything like that. It's actually because the dollar actually has been strengthening quite a lot. Now. I know if you can see the, this chart right here, right? You see? Right here, the dollar has been strengthening quite a lot. So that has caused the ringgit to weaken and caused the KLCI to actually plunge or fall significantly. So if you put this all together, we can expect the ringgit to turn higher or strengthen and that will benefit the KLCI, which has already adjusted lower. So what is the trade right here at the end of the day? The question is, again, uh, for those who are not really comfortable to invest overseas and everything like that, with the KLCI close to around 1500 right now, it would be a good opportunity to buy the KLCI index or maybe a little bit more aggressive funds, but I prefer the KLCI index outright. And in anticipation of the dollar weakening and the ringgit gaining, which will result in the KICI moving up to 1600. And so you can actually have a nice 10% gain right there, right? If I'm not mistaken, if you have a quick tactical trade right there. So, uh, and finally, uh, this on the bond side, I just want to say in Malaysia, the, if those who are not really wanting to take too much risk, Malaysian bonds look to be a good buy. Because Malaysian bonds and US yields follow them exactly. We are expecting US yields to continue trending a little bit higher, but Malaysian bond yields have actually adjusted significantly higher. You can see your yields in the US have moved up, and so Malaysian yields also have actually moved up significantly. This is the 10 year yield, and recently there's a big gain. So, why do I say it's a good buy, and how much return can you expect? If you look at the, okay, I don't want to talk about this one. If you look at how the long-term Malaysian yields have moved, they are actually at their peak right now, okay? So around 4.6, 4%, 3.6%. So if you buy a bond fund with corporate, uh, you know, good corporate, yeah, triple B and above investment grade kind of thing, uh, you can actually get a yield around 5%. And if the yields were to fall, you get an extra return and you can get up to 6 7%. So this is just speculative, it's not, got a guaranteed return, but there represents, a, there exists a very good opportunity in buying bond funds or buying bond ETF or coming through us where we can recommend which bond funds you can buy and you lock in the return. At least you would get better than what you would gain from the stock market. And also you definitely gain better than if you will put it in the in deposits. So bond funds, you have the downside at the current moment is limited. If you had invested here, where everybody says bond fund is safe, right? The reason why bond funds okay. are limited is because Thank you, you very much. Okay, <laughs> I will leave it at that. Thank then. you very much. So you mentioned, so you mentioned a few options that we can consider where we can go for. I mean, I mean, go for Wall Street because of the long term uh, view. Then of course we have the, the India, we have Indonesia, we have Australia where there's some potential over there. And also because of the weakening dollar that you're expecting, maybe in uh, a, a distant return around 5%, 10% is more than enough because at the moment we are seeing, and I, I think it's a uh, red buff or what you call that. Uh, a very uh, my portfolio even even few other portfolio that I've seen most of them are giving a negative return so so I believe that as long as we can keep a positive positive uh, view of it positive return that is more than enough. Yes. So, so probably is the next question is uh, something like this. So if we are now holding a losses or we are now holding. Uh, position they are not doing well, maybe it's a negative range. So, what should we do? I'm sorry, you're, I'm, you're cutting up. Hello? Hello? Oh. Hello? 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 Ah, I can hear you. I can hear you actually. Ah, sorry, sorry. Yes, Hello, what was your question? If you are in red right now, what would you have to do, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, so the question was, let, let's say now my position are all in the negative territory now of uh, 15 red. So, mm -hmm. so what, what should I do now? Uh, what, what steps should I, should I take? Okay, um, remember earlier I showed different, um, different asset classes, different charts, right? So from there, Eddie, you can see it really depends on what you're holding. 
So if you're holding like things that have fallen by a lot, you are really deep in the red, maybe sometimes it's good to cut loss and get up. Or okay. if you see stock markets have fallen some more, we already see the thesis that stock markets can actually bounce back up. You might want to hold down to actually get back, uh, claw back some returns. But if you're in the stock market, maybe it's just good to keep it for the long term. Uh, this, so it really depends on the asset that you hold uh, and, and how much the recovery of it. So this mainly you might need someone to talk to you personally. Uh, we can do that also depending on what you are holding. Uh. I can't just give a blanket uh, answer to this. But sometimes at the end of the day, it's good to just cut everything out. You know, if you're really very stressed and you don't know what to do and then hold back and then, uh, you know, listen to like smart, uh, smart investor here, you know, our sessions. And then you find out, okay, this is where I want to put, but really depends on your objectives. You know, we have to really be careful in order to, uh, to, to seek excess return, you know, 100%, 200% return. This is where a lot of people get in trouble. So if you have, you know, relatively good return expectation, you know, anything above 10%, you must really start to question it already. In the market, sometimes it's difficult to get unless you're very lucky. You know, even when I, when we invest and we are successful, we always say it's actually a lot to do with luck. So to answer your question, it really depends on your asset. Some of them you can hold, some of them you can let go. It really depends and you can talk to us on that, talk to a read smart investor on that. And sometimes it's also too good to just cut everything out since everything's gone crazy to hold back and to really manage and to find out what you're going to do for the long term. So really the difficult question to answer that really depends on what you hold. <laughs> Okay, thank you much, Suresh, for the for the enlightening. Okay, so I think now now we have a clear view when we know where, where we want to I mean invest for the long term or, or where we want to uh I mean sort of maybe switch funds or maybe switch our instrument asset is instrument class. So it all boils down to individual actually. So what is our objective? What is our uh, expected return? What was our risk tolerance and everything? So all that plays a part. And the best thing is we have an expert with us, which is get the best, and also uh, Suresh and the team. So they are the ones who. So if you don't know how to invest, where to invest your money and everything, you just can contact them. Later, I will share you the link. Where you can connect with them, and then we can have a more, more discussion on, on where, where to invest your money. Okay. So now moving on to the next question. But before that, I would like to uh, remind our audience today. If you have any other questions, you have anything that you want to ask our speakers, our, our distinguished guests, then by all means, just type in the Facebook, type in the comment section, then we, we address it towards the end of the session. Okay, so now my last question is, is for you, Crash, is about, okay, now, now you mentioned uh, the, the, I mean, the inflation, inflation is rising, with interest rates, everything. So how, any advice you can give to us on how how we can overcome it, how we can weather the storm, and maybe last question is how long do you think it will take for the market to recover? Ah, that's a good question. So what I want to show you is this particular thing uh, by title. Here we go. Good. Sorry, yeah. No, no problem. No problem. Okay. There's always a storm. Always, there's never a time without a storm. So like you see here, uh, here we had trade issues. So if you go back further, like Malaysia, here we had the, suddenly there was a temper tantrum. And then here we had one MDB. And then here we had Donald Trump winning and Bank Negara came up with 75, 35% rule. And basically here we had trade issues. Here we had the, um, what the, um, uh covid of course so yeah. there's never a time without a storm it's always some storm or another always always so uh one thing we we have to be careful of is not to look for safety rather to be very you know it's it's malaysia is it's like a boat with a big wave you know like you see the dollar is the big wave and we are the boat so in the same way, the, the, the strength of Malaysia is our population, the education levels, the connectivity. Malaysia can surf the wave very well. So in the same way, your portfolio also has to be the same way. You know, you have to be quite liquid, you know, and, 
and in that sense if you're invested in the in the markets you might also want to take opportunities at different levels and that you have to be very careful in watching it so it depends on type of objective kind of investor you are are you a speculative investor or the investor for the long term we've already given you options uh, of different types of investments that you can use perhaps one thing you want to look out for the long 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 term you know we were talking about crypto invest in companies that are involved in the blockchain because that will be a new kind of database which will be very big i i was in the markets when the, the dot-com bubble hit you know there was a huge amount of companies everybody was going to succeed in the internet nobody knew what the internet was but the few companies really made it yahoo's google's and everything so this is a good opportunity at the current level not the cryptocurrencies but the companies itself buy keep it away that will keep you away from the storm because you're not being exposed to like you know a storm go up go down and all the thing what you want to do other than that just understand there is always a storm and for you to actually benefit from this is to not be scared uh, to be able to cut loss at 10 percent, you better cut loss or to manage your investments well and to actually have core holdings into bonds actually uh, because they provide you better returns at the end of the day malaysian yields don't actually excessively move higher unless something really bad happens to malaysia in actual fact malaysia will benefit from higher oil prices so the finances of malaysia will be good so to to answer your question is um don't think of it as a storm la. it's just something that happens in the world you know our lives are full of 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 ups and downs upheavals so the market as a whole is just like a person with all the things going on in their head sometimes they get very sad sometimes they get very happy and then when they're sad you find out how long the sadness is going to last and when they're happy how long the happiness is going to last sorry to answer your question in a very funny way but i just want to show you that there is never a time where you know everything is smooth sailing i've not seen it ever okay thank you much guys for the nice energy i think i think we, we can relate to that because all this while we have been making good returns and been making good profits for the last 10 years, five years and whatnot. So it's just a matter of maybe we have to struggle for the next one, two years. Who knows? Because we have been overcome the COVID with the reopening of borders, with the vaccination rate, with the booster rate, everything. So I believe COVID has more or less subside. So it's a matter of um, uh, economy coming back and doing stronger with our borders opening and everything so it points to a very good uh, I mean positive catalyst uh, for the for the world actually and also for Malaysia and I think with the upcoming election that like you mentioned every time there's an election definitely the, the stock market will, will gain people will, will be in a better mood with everybody will enjoy and everything so I think it's, it's about uh, it's about to how you want to persevere for the next one two years maybe so once everything is okay then we forget about whatever happened these past few years because of course we tend to focus on too much on the negative side instead of we taking a longer view longer picture but mm -hmm. just just maintain just maintain your long-term view just make sure that if you're losing money if you're if you're too much uh heavy losses just, just like fresh mentioned, we can cut, then we start new. It's okay, it's okay. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes, everybody lose now and then. But as long as you manage your risk, your risk better, as long as you know your appetite, as long as you know you diversify your portfolio, for example, uh, then you can, you can have a I mean better prospect uh, at a, a long-term goal. So our admin have, have also put in the link. So for example, if you want to connect with uh, Red Vest, by the link and put in your details and we, and we keep in touch with you okay so for everyone who have any uh, any further questions but feel free to ask yeah Suresh. i just want to add something to what you were saying cut loss and everything right I, i've worked um, nearly 15 years in dealing rooms with traders and they usually make money on only 40 percent of their trades it's not 100 percent. so we always think the traders are geniuses and everything but really not really lah. you know they they cut their losses and they let their winners run so that is also one thing you want to do don't think just because you're losing money you are not clever because the professionals also always lose money they just make money in less than 50 percent of their trade so don't be so worried yeah <laughs> okay now that's news to us and that's news for me so i think i think we can learn learn, learn from what uh Suresh has mentioned is that even traders even professional traders who who is their uh, daily daily job or who's uh 
the bread and butter, their life basically on trading, they also make mistakes, they also lose. But as long as you cut your losses short and you make sure your winners uh, run, uh, then you can have a positive uh, positive, in, a positive outlook, outcome of it and you make money from the market. Whatever whatever instrument that you are, you are in. Uh, mm, take market, take profit also, market, don't forget, take profit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, take profit. You gain already, of take. Of course, of course. Once, once in a while, Sure, sure, sure. Once in a while, definitely we need to take profit, especially now the school holidays. Everybody, I I know that all all of the tourist tourist spots are all full. All the hotels are fully booked, and also yes. all the highways are jammed. Uh, so we know that people like to take profit and, and enjoy themselves. It's okay. Yes, so if yes. there's any any other question that, that our audience have have uh, in mind, just ask away, and we and we can get our our speakers to 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 help you uh answer their questions. So if there's no question, we want uh, to, to reach out to Red Best and also to help you out on your investment side of uh, investment part of it. If you don't know where, where to invest, how much to invest, uh, you, can, you can always keep in touch with Smart Investor and you can always uh, keep in touch with uh, Red, uh, Red Best team and we can we, we be here for you and we help you and, and, and we, we, help, we make sure that Everybody wins lah at the end of the day. So, yeah. so thank you very much for everyone for tuning in. Thank you, Suresh, for your time, for thank your you expertise, either. for your sharing, for your knowledge and everything. And I thank you everyone for watching since we uh since twelve thirty just now when we was online. And I hope to see you soon next week. So thank you again everyone and have a nice day. Have a nice day. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.